I start with prayer. <coughs> and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this chance to talk about you and the way you have led us to yourself. May we understand more deeply and more fully what you've done for us. We may love you more truly and follow you more faithfully. We entrust this time, this conversation, to the hands of our mother as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're joined by somebody new today. Uh, well, do everyone know what the Beverly Mike is? I don't know you. She's not new. Well, new to the new here. I've been other ones. Yeah. So welcome back, and as always. Thank you. Any questions before us asking for us? It's all good. So if someone's asking, probably everyone's asking. So you've been talking about the accident. Talking about God delivered his people. And a couple of things to kind of remember in the discussion is if you go back to Exodus, if you go back to Exodus, does anyone remember it's a week now? Does anyone remember what exactly the key theme, the key reason is that Pharaoh had sent, sent people away? Not in terms of the play, but in terms of what is most asking. What does Moses ask Pharaoh for? For worship. <laughs> worship. Yeah. So the central theme of is this is how the people come to worship God and love God. So it's all about the freedom is almost second. It is something that the Lord intends. It is something the Lord leads to. It is something that the Lord brings about. But it's almost secondary to what was worship done. We talk about the ten plagues and what why that and then we looked at now uh, that is last time the end of the last plague, death of the firstborn. Not only are the people set free, they're actually driven. They're forced. Whether they want to or not. You should spoil the engine. Before I go on to the Red Sea, there's another question here, and this is the question of how many people actually left Egypt? <laughs> and part of the reason why this is an interesting question, confusing question, difficult question, is because of the fact that ancient Hebrew, even modern Hebrew, to understand doesn't really do numbers what we do. The numbering system is, is, is more simple. The numbering system is tying it up. And, I mean, they certainly do have words. They have words. Uh, they spell it out. They don't normally spell out words. Right? If you were to, don't normally spell out 1,152, you could. Normally write numbers. You don't have numbers. They use spell the numbers. So, one in Hebrew is the same thing as a plus of. I'll be the equivalent of one and a being the same letter, the same thing, it's the same thing. Um, two is that. Three is given. Okay, we're well, really not going to remember this right now. No, no. <laughs> but there's a reason why I'm going through this. No, you learn about everything I tell you. I'm still scared that's in German. <laughs> the reason why this is this matters is because because of this we don't really know how people are teaching. So, the usual way the Bible is translated, 
would imply about 600,000 men. You can set up 600,000 families. Um, but there's some questions that we'll play in a minute. But perhaps there's only 60,000 and perhaps only 6,000. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I kind of lean toward the middle number. I think the Castile is too small. But you will find discussions saying all three. And part of it's because of the way they count. We'll look at this now. So numbers two. By the way, let me come back up. So the, the five books of the Torah, the books of the Bible, they aren't all chronological. They aren't all, all designed to be a chronological order. Right? The Genesis is, Exodus is, and the numbers that makes Deuteronomy aren't. And half that is it. Deuteronomy is Moses recounting the whole journey. So it, it, it covers stuff that defines Exodus. It covers stuff that defines Leviticus. It covers stuff that defines numbers. Often with a little more different details. Because this is a personal, this is his last speech to the people as he's dying, telling them goodbye. So he's emphasizing different things. He's not talking about Nexus. Numbers goes through a little bit more of genealogy. Leviticus focuses on the law. So different emphases, different things covering, and also sometimes it's the same event talked about in three different books. And it's all happened three different times. So it happened once, different books focus on different parts. But Numbers chapter 2 says this. These are the people of Israel as numbered by their father's houses. So, the earlier chapter breaks into the 12 tribes. All the camps were numbered by their companies were 603,150. The Levites were not numbered among the people of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses. Numbers chapter 1 breaks it down, and it's 46,000 in the tribe of Asher, 55,000 in the tribe of there's a problem with this number, or at least a question that you might come across. The first problem is that 600,000 men, soldiers fighting men, <coughs> would equal about 20,000 people. You add children, families, and kids, and everything else. <coughs> two million people, at the, or two to five million people. Five million people is bigger than the population of Egypt. Two million people would equal half the population of Egypt. If half the population of the United States was on the left, there'd be a big notice in the lost records. That seems really high. Um, you also have things like they pay 600 chariots and they're afraid. 600,000 men by 600 chariots, you think it wouldn't be that big a big deal. Um, you also see, so you'll, you'll also have somebody, sometime, uh, put together what it would take to feed and clothe and take care of them. So according to the Quarterback General of the Army, it would take 1,500 tons of food, 4,000 tons of wood as fuel, and 11 million gallons of water every day to supply the base needs. Uh, you also have difficulties with toilets. So it's very clear that toilets outside the camp. A camp this big is to be like two and a half miles long. You know. Um, and so someone in the center of the camp had to hike three miles each way to the Russia. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. But, but there are questions. A couple of possibilities here. One possibility is if you look at numbers given. They're all visible by like count. They're all If you go back and look at those numbers chapter one, you'll think of it as a direct head count. There'll be some odd numbers. Like right? 6,353. There's not. It's all directly, even all directly, um, with um, So one possibility here that you'll see in Exodus chapter 30. Is what's being counted is not directly the people. What's being direct, what's being counted is their, um, it's called atonement price. Basically, the yearly tie that required the care of the temple. 
And the book of Exodus chapter uh, 30, it says that every man, 20 years old, could be one counted in this group, is a half shepherd. which is equal, it says, to 10 girls, which no one knows what that means. <laughs> but this count by 10. And so one possibility then is that this is counting the number of your draws that the people are worth. Not direct not numbering of the people themselves, but numbering of the tithe they're owing to God. And in that case, you would take down by 10. And so it would be about 60,000 families, about 200,000 people. Or if ever, has anyone ever been a march for life in D.C.? Pictures. Yeah. March for Life about 300,000, 400,000 people. Think of a March for Life, a small March for Life, the idea of, if, if this is true, that would be. That's one possibility. A third possibility is that he was over to zero. And so the problem is, Gimel can mean three, it also means three thousand. Also, we don't that. Those are big, different numbers. <laughs> and so you have, for example, Numbers point one, chapter 1 saying, number of Reuben was 46,500. But could it be 46 and 500? Or 546? Which would mean I have about 6,000 math. About 20,000 people total. I think it's probably too small, um, but it's possible. And so the idea is that a lot of people come along, but exactly how many, we're not quite certain because of the numbering system of the people. Again, my suspicion, take it or leave it, is the middle estimate um, where you, the, uh, 60,000 plus families, so that's 100,000, 40,000 people, which is a lot, but a lot more Is yeah. there any um, documentation or anything that says what the population of Egypt was at that time? About 4 million of the estimate. Okay. Um, I mean, there's not a, yeah, documents back then are spotty. And you never know who's exaggerating for political reasons. Um, you know, th th there, there are accounts, for instance, as I think the right would do things like, if he would conquer territories, he'd very deliberately like, make giant suits of armor and leave them behind him. The people would, would assume there were giants fighting in his army, get scared. You know, uh, people, have, people would do that, things like that. So it's very easy to have a king writing, oh yes, in my population, so sometimes the numbers are hard to estimate, but four million is what I saw, okay. which is why two million people yeah. it, it is. That means every other person has a slave. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so there are questions. It's possible. Um, I mean, you don't really don't want this kind of the Bible, but I'm trying to figure out what, what it's saying, what it's meaning. These are possibilities. Uh, they said, my suspicion is the middle estimate. You know, for, there's still a lot of people. I mean, they're, not, they're talking about a lot of significant population. Um, but, and just to kind of, I mean, we look at the water for 40 years, and look what it took to move people. But again, we're used to, to, to drive in cars. We, we drive 200 miles in, in a few hours. Or airplanes, we drive across country, we fly across country in, in a matter of hours. In the Civil War, as a, these are armies, told them to travel 830 miles a day. With children to the up camp, imagine a lot slower. Pioneers and wagons covered about the same distance uh, in the 1800s. Um, which is why it took six months to a year to get across country, to get to, 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 to the planes. Um, so looking at people traveling, in a march for life is about three miles, and it takes six hours to get everyone across. Um, looking at people traveling, we're setting up camp, taking down camp, and people, you know, eight miles a day, ten miles a day is probably a good number. Which is part of the reason why, in a minute, 
it, it, bear up there. It's part of the reason why the one is so long. It's part of the reason why it takes long to get places. You know, where Moses got there very quickly, he's by himself. Getting people and crowds is a lot harder. Let's look then at the, let's see, a major theme you'll find here, and a very important thing that will come up back over and over again, is the fact God is trustworthy. God wants our trust. And he wants us to have this single hearted devotion to, to reach the promised land, to reaching heaven, following him. He wants a simplicity of heart, with this not being bogged down by things. And we see this, especially in this story here, where we're reminded over and over again God's always in charge. Nothing ever stumps him. Nothing ever throws him. Nothing ever is too much for him. God is always wants the best for us. And even when things seem impossible, it's the cares. The story of getting across the promised land, you would think, again, if this were a man-made story, made up in a fable, it would be a story of this great triumph where we did everything right, and we, we were always faithful to God, we listen to God and we saw the miracles and he got in care of us, so it was an easy trip. That's not the story. <laughs> the story is there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of backtracking, there's a lot of guessing, there's a lot of whining. Keep people give up. And God is always showing them over and over again his faith. And the next and then they'll trust them for a little bit. That's challenging along. They say, no, it's impossible. God can't be can here for us. And God will work a miracle. We'll trust God for a bit. And then things will happen. They'll go, no, this is impossible. God can't be here for us. It's a good thing we're different, right? <laughs> good thing I didn't do that. But this is it's a very honest, and a very open, and a very, and a very stark contrast what you would get with a fable. Right? This is God's chosen people. This is the people God's chosen. It's clear. It's not because they're so great. Not because they're so faithful. Not because they're so trustworthy. And it begins back with God. It begins back with God being good. God being faithful. God being trustworthy. And so our, our we're quote and learn especially from this, these moments and, and these discussions with the Red Sea and the cross the desert of Sinai. Hope you get it correct. At least the first three months. Or at the end of the this evening. Um, just that that truth. It's that reflection upon the fact that God is faithful, God is good, God is worth trusting. Even when it seems like he's not. Even when it seems like there's a huge problem. Nothing's a pot hard for God, difficult for God. He is the Lord of heaven and earth, the eternal. Okay. Easy to say, easy to proclaim, easy to sing and dance when we're feeling happy. That we're hungry and tired and thirsty, but we're the way to God's abandoned us. God can't do this, it's too much. Why we why I agree to follow you? So a major thing to look at and pay attention to. If you look at the Exodus chapter 12 and 13, discussing the establishment of Passover. Passover lasts seven days. The first day is when you have the slaughter of the Latin. Off the little blood lamb your doors, and there's seven days. <coughs> and the rabbis say it's seven days because it's on the seventh day, after a week of running around, walking out in front, moving out, and fleeing Egypt. And they arrive in the Red Sea. And the story of the Red Sea happens on the seventh day. The story of the Red Sea happens day seven, the last day of the Passover. So it's still God delivering his people, still God protecting his people, but God established this as a feast day of seven days as a reminder of what's the next day on the the Red Sea. And this is why in the story, you all know the story, right? They flee, they leave, they're in triumph. 
And then God says, go the long way around. Don't go the shortcut. Go a long way around. The shortcut would be crossing the past the land of Philistines. They go down south, they come back up, and then seven days later, they were here, Pharaoh hears this. You know, one more example of Pharaoh being hard hearted, Pharaoh being stubborn, Pharaoh being the jerk that he is. <laughs> and Pharaoh says, What have we done? We let them go from our service. They're just wandering around lost. We well, don't know where they're going. This kind of, this kind of wandering. Let's go capture them back, drag them back here. These people will use them. And he goes after them with this whole army. Um, Different ways to understand this. There's diff different people talk about this, but there is a um, 600 pick chariots, which would seem to mean first class or best chariots, um, and then a bunch of others. Not really given the numbers. And the rabbis look at this question that Ryan brought up earlier. How is it that there's still uh, animals to draw the chariots? The rabbis say these are the people, the chariots, the horses here are the ones who, when the hell came, listened and brought their horses inside. They're the ones who were willing to listen to God. That's how there's still some horses left. Um, but fair taste. The reason why, again, the court the rabbis, God leads them down, not down long or rather than up the area of the Philistines. Well, it's to prevent them from being discouraged. But they've just escaped, they're just, they're just they're fleeing from Egypt to slaves. And the last thing they're going to want to do is fight a war. The last thing they're going to want to do is fight a battle. And so, if they had to fight a battle, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even leave the land, according, according to the rabbis. They would get stuck, they would turn back, and they would just leave. So, God avoids a war as bringing them to the mountain to bring a covenant. But it means a long way around. It means not very much place. That means that there's now this difficulty in danger. And God leads them by a visible sign. There's a pillar of fire by night. And a pillar of cloud by day. And it stays with them the entire 40 years that they are traveling to Israel. A couple of things to note here. The first is the scriptures, especially in these places here, aren't always very clear about what this cloud is, what this pillar of fire is. And so sometimes it refers to it as God directly. Sometimes at first but as the angel of the Lord. And the rabbis give three different possible reasons. The first reason they say is um, when they say with the angel of the Lord they simply mean a action of God. This is simply putting a description because God's acting the message. Possible. Second possibility, rabbis say, is it's God and the heavenly host. Third is it's, it's an angel act on behalf of God. And the rabbis say the angel of Saint Michael. Um, so of course the pivotal, so the angel here is the Lord. We can either mean simply God Himself, or it might Saint Michael, or it might mean God and heavenly hosts. Um, the scripture is not exactly clear. Um, and it probably does depend upon the moment. There are times where clear there are angels there, there are times where clear it's God acting, there's times, times where it seems to be the angel of God, and times when it's the angel speaking for God. Um, is that just for the cloud or is that for the fire too? Uh, both. Both, oh. yeah, for both. Uh, but it also has to do sometimes with God speaking. Uh, so, for example, so you have in, in the New Testament, um, Paul says God spoke through angel. Think of the book of Hebrews, I believe. It says God spoke through angel. But it says, so does that mean that it says God speaks is just kind of in reference to the, the, the ultimate messenger, the ultimate 
origin. <clears throat> At other times, probably, but there are times where I clear he's speaking too. Right? He comes to Moses, and Moses, Moses sees him, and sees him, and um, that's why his face glows, because of God's presence. That's one that's an angel. At other times, are there angels speaking? Yes. But which ones they are, it's hard to tell. The idea behind this is simply this. So this is now me speculating, describing, giving it. So take this with salt if you want to. But the thing behind this is this. A couple of points, three of this. And the first point is simply to say, this is so awe-inspiring and awesome and incredible. We can't describe it. You know, this is not ordinary human things, right? If it were ordinary, we say, oh, yeah, we've got the king and then his, his advisors, and it was fine. But again, yeah, this is just, it's all glorious. In the book of Revelation, um, John, who saw Christ rise from the dead, is described being an angel of the divine without a worship, if he was God. And he'll stop him and say, don't know, I'm just an angel, I'm a servant of God, God, God we don't worship him. We worship God. St. Teresa of Avila says that if you saw a soul in, in sanctifying grace and you didn't know any better, you would think they were God. So then part of it is, A, to say this is just so incredible and so awe-inspiring, it's not really clear, it's just all the ground. And then the second thing is to show us that God is, is truly coming to dwell with us. And this, this is God dwelling with his people in a unique way. Preparing the way of the time that he comes in person, but I am his Lord. And so I, I think I think that there, there is a very deliberate reason why there is this confusion. Like why is the, or, the ordinary human um, it's all so grand and awe-inspiring? I saw an angel, I saw God, it's, it's all just too much. And they also would say when God comes as a man, he's gonna come in. He's gonna come. In the, in the form of a servant. It's going to come um, in a way we can grasp and see. I think a note here is if you look at other revelations and other religions, Muhammad or Joseph Smith or other things, usually the revelations happen in secret. Right? Someone and a vision up in a cave, someone was meditating and praying and appeared to them. Everybody sees this. It's not just a select group of his friends. Not just Moses and his 70 buddies saw this. Not just Moses and the leaders saw this. The entire people see the, 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 the plagues. The enemies see, see the, the, the fire and the cloud. Everybody sees these things. It's not a hidden thing, it's not a private thing. It's a very public thing. So that they have faith in Moses, a faith in God, a faith in something different. The people who were called to me, remember, at this point, they're half pagan. At this point, yes, they were following Abraham. Yes, they were trusting of Abraham. Yes, they believed in one God. Yes, they were worshiping God. But Joshua has to tell them, has your idols. Moses is telling them, set aside your idols. They look for idols um, when it comes to the, the golden calf. Even, even as far as the Babylonian captivity, he followed an idol version. And so God is purified. <coughs> and they have to leave behind everything to follow this, this Yahweh. And follow him not just as a God or as one of the many, but as the only true God. And some of them don't get it. And in fact, we see in the end they reject his gift and his blessings. It is too much. <laughs> the reason why there's a 40 year wander. <laughs> and that was, that was visible the whole 40 years, you said? Yep. Wow. Okay. There also another miracles too there that happened every single day for 40 years. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. You also had you know, things like Moses' face would glow every so often. I mean, when you saw God, you had the cloud of presence. You had thunder lightning on Sinai. You had, you know, very visible public miracles happening. Continual miracles. You know, um, I said, <clears throat> forget where it is in the Bible, that's one blank now where it is. But it just says that when they wander, even though they wander 40 years, 
They're closing up all the part of the shoes in the, uh, in the, in the, in the frame. No, it's this holy miracle. It's not a miracle, but it's a nice one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, yeah, they had to walk and they had to work. The Lord was making it easy for them. They can't make it hard for themselves. But the Lord, the Lord was there. And so when they rebel and don't trust God, it's not that the gods have hidden it from them and they have to just trust the word of some guy. It's they've seen to the play. So they've seen the deliverance of Egypt. They've seen these promises. They've seen all these things happening that very same day. And they just trust God and rumble against God and reject him. It's not like us, of course. <laughs> but very public things. And so one of the things that, that, that I think is a very deliberate reflection, again, this, this is my speculation, uh, my meditation, so take it as much as you want, is I do think this is a very deliberate mirroring of Pharaoh's heart. Right? It's not, it's not that Pharaoh is far to be able to see, see the Egyptian, but the Israelites were so wonderful and all that we were so great and wonderful. Everyone's hard of heart. Right? The Lord's coming, working with hard-headed dominates. <laughs> Again, we're different, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. The Lord comes continually in patience and love and care to soften the hearts, to change hearts, to heal sinners. Mm -hmm. It's the whole story of um, well, even the whole history, the history. Things Fulton Sheen describes this as the divine romance. God, God came to woo his bride, uh, coming to seek her out and talk to her and soften her heart and beg her to come to him. And that's what you see. Continue, and it hasn't ended even that. God's still begging us to come back and return to Him and convert. Because again, you look through this promised land, you'll see yeah, that Pharaoh kept changing his mind going back, but so do his own people. They'll follow God at certain points, but they'll leave them. <laughs> So the Red Sea, they come to the Red Sea, the sea splits. Israelites follow through. Um, well, let me back up actually. First, notice that they're there. You know, they see the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud. And again, they cry out to God saying, well, you're gonna kill us now? Can we have died in Egypt? We're not gonna be brave in Egypt, we're gonna die here. And they see Pharaoh's arm. It's impossible, I can't say it, it's too much. What do you do with Moses? The pillar of fire steps in between the armies. Then all the can't be close. And then a strong east wind. The east is important. From the east comes salvation and life. It's the resurrection. It's the dawn. The east is a name for the Savior. From the east comes the wind that parts the sea. The water is described as a wall left on the right. And again, if I were an Egyptian soldier, and I just saw ten plagues, <laughs> and I had just seen a pillar of fire move around to protect these people, and then a sea splits in half. <laughs> yeah, I'm going on. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to, you know, chase after these guys. You know? <laughs> yeah, but if you don't, the pharaoh will kill you. But if I were Pharaoh's advisors, I mean, if I were the general, I would say enough's enough. You would think. You would think. You would think. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just testimony to, you know. I always used to, to, to kind of marvel when our Lord says in the, the parable of, of the rich man and Lazarus, right? With the, with the, you yeah, have the poor man who dies, he's to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man dies, he's sent to hell. And he cried at Abraham to send someone out to protect my brothers at least, mm -hmm. and tell them to, and, and the Lord says, they have the prophets of Moses to them. And the rich man says, oh no, but if they had the sunrise of the dead, then they believe. And God says, no, they would not even that. And I was kind of thinking, that, that's, that's exaggerated, surely but they believe that. But, no, unfortunately, we, we can be stubborn enough as a matter of what we see. 
It doesn't matter who tells us, it doesn't matter what miracles we witness. And that in the end, we either choose to follow God or die. And so the sea splits, they follow after, and then the Egyptian army rises. This is, this, is the, this is the end of Pharaoh's ability to follow them. Right, so Pharaoh, in chasing after these people, refusing to worship God, has lost livestock, wealth, going to trade, his own son, now his power. All they had to do was let the worship go. A little while later, let me stop there. Questions on this? So I know we're kind of speeding through things. I, I just have a Please, Jay, yeah. A question if you know it, if you know this or not, right? Yeah. I vaguely remember reading quite a few years ago in some kind of it was a, a, a I don't know if it was National Geographic or if it was Smithsonian, but they actually found like chariots and things on the bottom of the Red Sea. There's actually actual archaeological proof that this biblical event happened. I did see that. I, 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 did, I did see that. I, I am not certain how many they found. Okay. Um, and so the um, the only question that I think people would raise if they were skeptical of the Bible was would it would it equal the number of the whole army? Okay. And I don't know that they've dug around enough to find that. I know they found a bunch of them. I don't know if they would say it's enough. Now certainly you and I would say yeah. I mean that's yeah. proof to us. Well, it actually verifies that I did read that. So yeah, sure yeah. No, I, I, I saw the same. I know the same article, but I saw a similar find. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean the the thing is, remember the ones reporting it. Usually don't believe it. <laughs> well, they um, didn't count the 498 that went the other way. <laughs> <laughs> so, what? Yeah. If they found one, yeah. they could prove it to us. Right. Yeah, and then they, they found a few, and it is the very deep part of the sea. You could also see people who. There, there, there is a, a trend that began, well, actually began in the 1600s with, with the rationalists. You know, they try to explain the miracles. And, and so you will see every once in a while that people say, well, the Red Sea has a bad translation. It's really the Sea of Reeds, they cross the marsh. Yeah, I saw that. You know, yeah, I saw um, that. You know they'll, they'll say, well, the, the manna isn't really a miracle, it's really just these, these plants they found. And Loaves and the fish isn't really a miracle, it's really the people share. You know, <laughs> we'll explain it away. But what was found, these chariots, was found in a very deep part of the sea. Yeah. Uh, what wasn't, a, you know, a, a three foot shallow pool or a marsh area, it was a very deep part, something that would have been very impressive. Um, something that would have been, again, wall can be anything from a city wall, which could be 50 feet high, to a wall like this. Either way, it's got to be enough force to really do messy up. And either way, if I saw a, a log like that on two sides, and people walking through, I would say, you know what? <laughs> you know, maybe it's just the wind. Maybe it's not. I want to wait. <laughs> you know. But again, they, they followed they, they followed them into the heart of the sea with the water on the left and right. They followed them, they put their plow in front of them. They followed them after seeing all the plagues. Maybe they wanted to just go with them. Maybe <laughs> 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 it could have also been hate, right? Because people are very irrational. I, I think that was that's part of it, yeah. I, mean, I definitely think part of it was anger and hatred. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think there was definitely a desire to destroy these people and rid of them to punish them very severely. Uh, so I definitely, I think the Pharaoh's first fear is over. He's mourned his son, now he's one more. 
So I, I think, I think irrational. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, to the point again where he's fighting God, and that's not a battle you win. <laughs> So what's that? He said if Satan could learn that lesson, a man would True. <laughs> Satan knows he's lost. Mm -hmm. but, he, but he's a spoiler. He's a bad loser. And so he wants to make everyone else suffer as possible as he goes down. Um, so with a human battle, human war, we surrender and hopefully get some mercy. He just wants to he just wants to destroy us again. That pure hate. Exodus chapter 15, verse 22 to 27. We have the miracle of the waters of Moran. The people are traveling and they're running out of water. And only spring they find is very bitter. Some drinking. We can't drink this water. And after they said, God take care of us and we're fine. Right? No. <laughs> what they say is, everything's hopeless. What are you doing here? Um, let me really go find exactly what the words that they say. It just, it just says they grumble. Okay, so here it didn't say what they're grumbling, it said they grumble. They're mad at Moses. What are we, what are we, what are we drink now? And the miracle is they take a piece of wood, a piece of tree, and it's tossed in the water, the water comes right. A couple of interesting things here to look at. Traditionally, the wood tossed in, if you ask the rabbi, they'd say the wood was a bitter tree. And if you ate the priest's sap, it would be bitter, it would be nasty. And they say, but through God, the bitter makes the bitter sweet. What we have here is pointing to the cross, where something bitter, something painful, something bad in itself cures something else that's bitter and painful and bad. Or through the wood of the cross, that, that is where Christ dies. It cured, it makes what is unbreakable, it makes the passage to um, heaven impossible. The way the cross sweetens that, makes it possible, the passage not only for a life, it's sweet. It will be wrong because it was something we can have with ease. So you have here salvation through wood. And the church fathers are very fond of going through the scripture looking at how many times do you have salvation through wood? You have, you know, of course, the, the Ark of Noah. You have Aaron's staff. You have, you know, the tree at Marah. The tree of life, the garden. All pointing to the cross. And the fact that it's a bitter tree, we see it's a bitter tree, which makes, it cures bitterness to the command of the Lord and throwing in the waters. You have here a description and a, and a predictive. You know, again, you have this thing where God is something care of. Everything's going to be okay. And they end up finally on the leave after they get their drink. And the leave they find this is, this is a number which, again, special charges, they take the number, it's going to be very, very, very significant. There's 12 springs. And there's 70 palm trees. Why are these numbers different? The tribes and the elders? Tribes and the elders. Yeah. So 70 people that left uh, to eat for Egypt, not uh, under Joseph, said there's always 70 elders, and 12 tribes. In other words, not only did, did I give you water drink, give you one for each. <laughs> You're all fine. And of course, now, now and then, from here on out, everyone trusts God, this is to God, and never remembers that ever again. Until next time. Exodus chapter 16. We have now been traveling for a month. 
heading out towards China. And they're running out of food. There is a rabbi who I was reading to the uh, Craigslist class. Um, so, with little parentheses. One of the great Jewish commentators of the scripture is a man named that's goes to be called Rambam, which is an acronym for his real name, which is Rabbi Moses Ben Mamet. <laughs> well, or somebody that was talking about. Probably don't talk about him. He died twelve seven. So yes, yeah, so so he, this guy and this other guy are two of the most famous mid mid medieval commentators for the rabbis. Um, but the, the way the, the their titles work is that they like doing this. They go Rabbi Moses Ben, and then his last name. Uh, this other guy is right, Mo Moses Ben. Also called Maimonides, also called Maimonides, uh, um, but Rambam. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he says here is he says, um, so a quote from a different place here in our, our class. One that Rambam says, so he died here 12 seconds. I didn't see him. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be awfully surprised. Oh, it was a miracle. <laughs> uh, great. <laughs> According to him, um, he sees somebody who was very traditional in his interpretation, always wanted to look, he, he never wanted to contradict or argue with the older rabbis. Other companies at the time were a little more aggressive. He was not. Um, he says, at the Red Sea, at the Exodus, it wasn't just one meal they prepared. You know, they, they, they ran out to, to leave the uh, um, at the Passover when they had when they prepared their bread to leave. He says it was not meal, it was not food for a month. He says there were sixty-one meals prepared, sixty-one days worth of bread they took them, and now they run out. Um, pause. So he, he, he thinks that they are over, over prepared for Passover. But the fact is, the start of the second month, got no food left. No food left. And naturally, the people turn to God and say, Lord, you can save us, we trust you, you're so good. This is what they say, Exodus chapter 16, verse 3. Rather than being here and dying of starvation, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. At least there we sat by the flesh pots and ate the bread to the full. For you, Moses, have brought the whole assembly, assembly out of the wilderness to die of hunger. And they longed for the leeks, the cucumbers, the melons, and the fish. They're mad. And God promises two things. God, first of all, says, you're going to have enough, enough meat. There's no bread meat for you. And they say, that's not possible. There's too many people who for It's not enough to provide bread for you. Impossible. You have here, first of all, in the evening, you have quail from the covered camp. So a one-day miracle will be released. When the fowl will come to cover the camp, and they can gather it up, and they can eat meat. You also have a continuous miracle of the man. And the man is very significant because as this happens then for the next 40 years, every single day. And it feeds them the rest of their journey. They still comply, yes. They still get tired of it, yes. They still <laughs> say one different food in this, yes. <laughs> but they're fed every single day. <coughs> In the matter, there's three different miracles. Um, let me back up first of all. The word manna um, seems to come from an expression meaning, what is this? 
<laughs> Perhaps a more modern translation would be think of it. What's more modern? <laughs> And they see it there, what is this? And that becomes the name of, of, the, of the gift of God. What's this? <laughs> <laughs> it's just so useful. So in Madden it means, what is this? What is it? It's described as white and as a bread-like substance, as round, flat discs. Um, White. It describes having the taste of flour mixed with honey. So it's sweet, right? The Book of Wisdom it says it pleases every taste, according to some traditions. It would change its flavor depending on the people. It's satisfying. It's filling. And every day, enough would appear for everybody. And God told them, don't gather for tomorrow. <laughs> Only gather enough for today. I'll find you tomorrow. Except on Friday. We had two portions. Because on Saturday and Sabbath day, there'd be no... Right. If they if they try to save it, store it up, and they can have it and trade it, the very human thing, the next day would turn moldy, be full of worms. Can it be human store? But every day there was enough, but Saturday it was kept over and same, it would not be moldy. It would still be fresh. So again, a continuous miracle. Where every day they're given enough bread to eat, and it's Unusual, but it's, 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 it's described as appearing with the dew. The dew comes down, it evaporates, this is left behind the ground. They have to gather it up and they can bake it or pair it. Now, there's really three miracles here. We've been talking about it more than four or five, but three main miracles here. And the first is source, described even by our Lord as the bread from heaven. I'm going to read you this long quote. This is from Rambam. Now we know, of course, this is a preparation of the Eucharist. Our Lord himself talked about this in John chapter 6. But listen to how the rabbis do. This, this, this is beautiful. How is it is that Rabbi is asking, how is it called bread from heaven? He says, some people will both say that you know, the angels eat food and they have real bread that's existing up in, up in the sky. He says, no, that's, that's, this is that silly. I'm paraphrasing. This is not here. That's silly. Angels don't have to eat. He says, however, that this is something that comes from the divine light comes from God himself, because it, it, it's almost tasting God in a certain way. The existence of the ministering angels, the heavenly court, those angels around God's throne, does not depend upon something tangible, something physical, evolved in the light. Their existence of the angels is a means of the higher light itself. They survive, they, they feed upon God himself. Um, they gaze upon God, and that's their, their nourishment, the rest of their life, their life. They see God face to face. It was for this reason, the heavenly origin of the manna. The Israelites found in the manna every flavor they desired. The rational power of the soul causes it to cleave to the higher worlds, heaven itself, and therefore we find the rest of life and obtain God's flavor. So because of his order, because of the bread from heaven, he from God. Scripture is alluding, alluding, according to the words of Rabbi Eliezer Kizma. So this is someone earlier than Rambam, I'm not sure when he lived. Someone earlier. 
And those inheriting eternal life in the world to come, this by the substance of the matters of the higher glory. Rabbis have said, in the world to come will neither be eating nor drinking. Christ says this. Rather, the righteous of the world will become will sit with their, their crowns on their heads and enjoy the divine glory. This means those inheriting the world to come will exist by their enjoyment of the divine glory, which will cleave for the crowns upon their heads. The crowns, the attributes, were named by Scripture, where it says, In that day shall the eternal hosts be for the, for the crown of glory. References this, this is said even upon the crown which the mother crowned him. Thus, the virtues of the world lose the manner in which the righteous inherit the world to come be sustained, the hint of belonging something to the manner. Let me paraphrase that. What, what the rabbi is saying, the lady is saying, that the manna points to eternal life. It is a, a share, and it's in a small way to God's own glory. And it's God Himself feeding and nourishing His people. Can you guess why this is a preparation for the Eucharist? <laughs> Miracle one is orange. Miracle two. Have continual reliance upon God. God does never want us to rely upon things. He wants to trust upon our wealth, our power, our glory, our money. Rely upon Him. And so the Lord could have provided them enough for the rest of the journey. What He says, He wants to your trust. Let me take care of you. I'm going to feed you every day. You have to let me. Will you pray now, Father? Give us this day our daily bread, which refers to the true bread from heaven. Let me read to you again, so on the same lines, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, 34. A verse we're all familiar with. This is during the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. Do not sow nor reap the gather not to make a barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more important than they? Can any of you by worrying at a single moment to your lifespan? Why make this by your clothes? Learn from the way the wildflowers grow. Do not work nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory is arrayed like one of them. If God so clothes the grass of the field which grows today and is thrown into the oven tomorrow, do not much more provide for you, you little thing. Do not worry and say, what do we eat, what do we drink, what do we wear? The problem of the Israelites, the desert. All these things the pagans seek. Your Heavenly Father knows we need all of them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you besides. We don't worry about tomorrow, or tomorrow will take care of itself. Vision for the day is the evil thereof. God says he provides manna that people will learn manna will live that live bread alone. But by every word that comes to the mouth of God. It doesn't say that they don't need bread. Say was don't rely upon bread. Rely upon me. Trust me as I care for you every single day. For 40 years, at least care for every single day. And you also have then this, this special particular care where you have the, um, on the Sabbath, it keeps. It's showing that the man itself is a reflection of God's own rest, of God's work in the world. God rests on the Sabbath day. Those make bread. 
Because he's trying to get them to share in his rest. The Sabbath was them sharing in God's own rest. This is the day that they would laugh with God and be with God and close to God. And so you have here then this bread that comes from heaven. It's seen as this gift bread from God, 24 years from Lord, which shows the table that God is care for them every day and points to the Sabbath, points to, to resting with God. Does it make sense why this is a type of the Eucharist? The points to hold the communion. Where God comes truly the best man, we chant feed upon literally God himself. Where we kiss daily our, our daily bread, our, our daily strength, our life, our, our hope. And we share not just in his rest, but in his very life itself. Which is points out of the rest to share in God's life. This is cool. <laughs> Questions on this? So, yeah. So, a matter about us, they move forward in the second month of their journey until they get to Israel, they're fed every single day. Every day they, they, they see this. Every day they see the cloud from the fire. The man of Masa, however, they head deeper into the desert, and there's no more water. Naturally, of course, they trust God and turn to Him and say, "Lord, thank you for taking care of us." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here there was no water for the people to drink. They crowed with, crow with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said, Why do you crow with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Here they had a thirst for water. The people grumbled against Moses, saying, Why did you ever make us leave Egypt? We just have us to die here of thirst for children or livestock. <coughs> Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with the people who mourn? They will stone me. So God says, go out and the rock there, strike the rock, and it will come water and be fishing for you. <clears throat> Again, they doubt God while they're seeing miracles. They're gathering the food in the morning and they're saying, God can take care of us. Because he's not giving them water until, until they ask. Right. What they want is everything to be comfortable. No one's ever to happen in their schedule, in their time, in their way. I want them to rely upon him, not upon the food or the water, the clothing, or anything else. And from the rock, it's impossible thing to spring of water. Right, the spring of water. Paul in First Corinthians chapter ten says this rock is the type of Christ, where from Christ's heart, from Christ's life. From the rock comes grace and life eternal when we're walking together trying to get to our sight, trying to get to our promised land. It's also here where Moses grumbles against anger. What his sin is, it's not exactly clear. And in fact, Ramban says it's one of the great mysteries of the Torah. It's, it's, it, it's hidden from our eyes because we don't, we don't want to judge Moses partially. Some say it's anger, the overly anger of the people. That he was yelling at them, calling them names because he was fighting back. Some say that it's a, a doubt of God himself, or Moses doubt of God. He gets the rock, he strikes it once, something happens, strikes it a second time, and only then the water comes out. Mm -hmm. So that doubt of God um, is what is punishment. We don't really know. Um, in the Psalm 106, it says, well, this other words were rash. What those words are, we don't know. <laughs> um, usually Moses, Moses is described as a very meek, quiet man. I don't know get but <laughs> most of us do. Um, but as a punishment, he's told you're not going to be able to go into the promised land. 
You can go up to the gates, up to, up to the edge, but you can't enter. Acts of consequences. On the one hand, this is really unfair. You've got to lead the people, you've lived for 40 years, and you still don't get to go in. On the other hand, the Lord is purifying all this for the true promised land. And the Lord is keeping him from any of the smallest anger and doubt and fear and since one time. But in the saints, these things are our bigger needs. Right? Those who walk off of God, see God, know God, their sins are more important. Their sins are bigger because they can't hide behind um, ignorance or lack of grace, lack of God's help. And so Moses, the Lord purifies him of these dreads. And so Bo Moses spends his time knowing he's not going to achieve the goal. But still glorifying God, loving God, and serving God. And therefore this gets purified of him, this gets taken from his heart. So he's still the apostle of God. He's, but, but even after this, right, he sees God face to face, he sees God's glory. Um, it's, it's interesting how the Lord deals with us, how the Lord works with us. And again, not to be one of you, right? One to say, oh, Moses, wink, wink, okay, they're just kidding now, they get back from you. you know. the, the Lord is, is just and fair and good. Just not what we would like him to be. It's a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the there's a tradition, okay, I'm going to make it good. There's a tradition that the rock fall after them, that, that the rock move in the desert, with the spring of water flowing from it. I don't, I question that simply because there's a lot of times they grumble about water. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> is it possible? Absolutely. Um, the it's one of those things where, where um, people like embellishing stories, you know, and it doesn't take that long for the story to be embellished. And so, and so sometimes we have in the scripture gets embellished. It's not clear was that authentic tradition or was that an embellishment to make a point. Um, even, even like, you don't, you don't back very far, but George Washington the chariot. Historians say it never really happened. It's a nice story and makes, to, to prove something about his character. And so certainly it proves something about God and what God does for us, but whether or not the rock literally followed after them and trade them and walked with them, in some ways it doesn't I mean, it matters in terms of did it happen or not, but in terms of changing the story, or changing God's business, or changing God's care for his people, it doesn't. Um, but there is a traditional one. Questions? In the same chapter, we have this kind of abrupt introduction to the nation of Amalek. And Amalek decides they want to destroy, attack, and kill Israel. Amalek is the aggressor. They see this great crowd of people coming into the territory, probably competing for water, for land, everything else, and they want to get rid of them. They start a war. And you have here the story, again, probably all of us must know. You have in your doctrine, first of all, Joshua, who is the aide of Moses, Joshua ben Hur. Joshua becomes aide of Moses, in fact, he takes over after Moses uh, passes. Now, a great battle is fought that takes place in a battle. And Moses goes up to pray. And it says, as long as he kept his hands upraised, Israel wins. He gets tired, drops his hands, stops praying, on the left wins. In other words, these people are more powerful than them, they're stronger than them, they're better than them. Well, God has their own come. Now, upraised hands, what form am I in? <laughs> Across. Um, Ram Bond 
says that it's the Ten Fingers of the Ten Commandments. He also, you know, the, he's not going to talk about the cross. <laughs> but it still it is the union with God, following God, believing God, trusting God. Look at the cross. It's so important that Joshua and Aaron support his arms. Help him keep his arms up raised that Allah let him feed in the story. We're being told here again as the cross this is the victory over the people who destroy us. What does destroy us and entering the promised land? Sin, the devil, our weaknesses. But to overcome them, you have to put them rely upon the cross and upon prayer. By ourselves, if we keep if we turn away from Christ, turn away from our from praying and asking for help, we're gonna fall. We'll fall as long as we relax and get tired and lazy as the others to us trouble. Kind of good back to for life. But as long as we look to the cross, look to prayer, we'll, we will have that help. And we also then show us the, the importance of having good, good companions. Help. People who help to us. People who to pray for us, walk with us, support us. Um, physically, like, like at my bonus. Of the spiritually and intellectually and every other way, people who you know, in their lives help us. People who are going to be helping us, there are these things in our life that attack us. Exodus 19, I'll be picking up and around. Um, next time, I think we'll move a little bit, there's a little more. Then let's jump in around next time. They wanted to get us through these next three months as well happens um, before we get to stuff here. Um, Exodus chapter 19, we have three in Cranbourne events. We have God as the promises to take care of them to make them his own people. They finally get this Mount Sinai. It's been three months. They've been walking and traveling and fleeing. And they fought a war, they had these miracles, they gained the manna, and they finally they're at the foot of the mountain. The third month after the departure from the land of Egypt, on its first day, Israelites came to the desert of Sinai. There they pitched camp. The Lord called to Moses and said, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, but tell the Israelites, You have seen for yourselves how I have treated the Egyptians and how I brought you up on eagle wings and brought you here to myself. Therefore, if you hearken to my voice and keep my, com my covenant, you shall be my, my special possession. Dearer to me than all other people, the wall of the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And he says to Moses, prepare for three days. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to give you my law, my words. And I'm going to draw this together. Take this together. And prepare. In fact, they, they wait. And then God comes with fire and lightning and storm. Trumpet blast. And the people freak out. Can't understand why. And they all back up and say, you know what, Moses, you go by yourself. Tell what God wants. Whatever he, whatever he says, we'll do. But you go and talk to him. We don't want to. You go by yourself. He just prays before he leaves for the master. Um, and by the commandments, the covenant, and of course, while they're, while they're gone, the people, of course, are faithful and. No. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll save that for another time. But, but again, the, the point I want to make here is first of all, you have people here who see God, see his power, see his glory, they recognize this, they're, they're afraid of to step back and say, not worthy. Though quickly does that thing. Um, okay. So just again, again, I know we, we bounced around a lot today and kind of ran through a bunch of things real quickly. But this is the three month journey from uh, the Passover to the beginning of the cup. This is God preparing them in three months. That doesn't sound like very long to us. Three months is a long time. <laughs> I've had that for years. Right? 
lasts for only 40 days. And how often do you how long does that seem to us sometimes? <laughs> so this, this is three months of life. Um, but in that time, again, they're, be, they're being emphasized God's taking care of them, they can trust Him, God feeds them, God, take, God waters them, God gives them meat, and now God's going to make them His own people. This is the invitation they're given. These are the promises that God makes to them. And God keeps his promises. God is never outdone. Let's leave it there. Next time I'm going to go through some parts of the law and the golden calf. Please, yes. Um, so the rock at Corinth, that was the rock that they were going to build the rock. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10 describes it as the symbol of Christ. Um, where, where it says that, that the when Christ was pierced, he, he poured out blood and water. He washed us from our sins, cut us from sins, bring us to himself. And so this is almost a, a symbol of baptism, a symbol of Christ's crucifixion, uh, where, where something that ordinarily would not nourish and give life does. And so death gives life, Christ gives life. Uh, this, 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 is, this is the symbol of Christ uh, feeding and nourishing and giving life to his people. Okay, so that's the water. Yes. And, and it, well, let me read to you first Corinthians chapter 10. See, okay. see, see, see if it answers your question. If it doesn't, uh, we can talk about it. <coughs> first Corinthians chapter 10, verse. One to four. I do not want to be unaware, brothers. Their answers are all under the cloud, or the black cloud, and the pass of the sea. All that are baptized in Moses and the cloud of the sea. Meaning Moses brought the world. All at the same spiritual food. The matter. All drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was the Christ. Oh, okay. And so all the things that happened to the, the, the Israelites is preparation for what Christ is doing by coming, by redeeming, and by saving. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Please. So, uh, with this whole thing this evening, basically, those people were very much like almost exactly like Pharaoh, because Pharaoh kept taking it and taking it and going back and going back. And these people got all these miracles and they still didn't get it, it seemed like. So they were, in a way, very similar. Yes. The Egyptians and... Yep. And I would go one step further and I would say they're very similar to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yeah. really yeah. see the relations yeah. to what we're going through today. Uh, I mean, they're very similar to us. And I would say you also have here your own individual spiritual life. We make promises to God, we tell God I'm going to sin in my life, and then we get tired, we stop praying, we think, well, I'm going to conquer that sin, and you stop praying, and so you hold it away. You know, we have to cross through deserts and, and give up things. It's hard, we complain. You know, I, I don't want to give up chocolate well, for... I'll see the miracle that you know, you're you're you know, we, 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 And we, we know what everything means. It's not like we're... You know, unlike the Israelites, they didn't know the end of the story. We know how the story ends. We, we, we've seen Christ crucified. We've seen Christ by the dead. We've seen salvation. And we're still stubborn against. <laughs> and I think that's part of the point. Is that's why it's recorded here for us. Is we're being told, first of all, be careful. Second of all, patience with yourself, because the Lord will. And third of all, trust God. That God's overcome even by this. He, even this, not too much for God to overcome as long as I love so Yes, absolutely. So, again, yeah, if we just read the story and say, Pharaoh's an idiot and a jerk, but we're so right, we miss the point. <laughs> and, or if we say, Pharaoh's an idiot and they, 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 they're not too for idiots, you miss the point. There. The author of the scripture, Moses, our Lord, is telling us, you all need help. This should be something to make you reflect upon your own heart and say how good God is, how trustworthy God is, 
Let me now begin to trust him better. Let me give him now more of who I am and trust him more. Because how often do I fail? How often do I get upset, nervous, and scared, and freak out when things will go my way? And then what happened more in my life? Things get tough and difficult. No one here in the room, of course, but people in general. Uh, one of my things that I've gotten out of the 40-year journey is kind of pragmatic is with these stubborn uh, people and their habits they picked up from Egypt is 40 years is two generations worth of people. Yeah. The people that came out of Egypt, they were one group of people with their beliefs and habits and such. Their children were on the journey. They had children on the journey. The people who come to the promised land of Israel, they're kind of a fresh start, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And in fact, that's explicitly stated that, that, that of the people left Egypt, only two end up in Israel mm -hmm. uh, Caleb and Joshua. Everyone else dies in the desert. Uh, it's, it's, it's very explicit. We haven't gone through it, but yes, it's, 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 it's stated explicitly uh, only two of those who left Egypt um, end, up in, end up in the Promised Land. So it was very purposeful for that long period of time well do. it was very purposeful in the, in the sense of yeah the time period was yeah it will see so after the covenant they actually get the promised land and they reject it and that's when there's a 40 year journey it was after they reject the promised land because they're, they're scared to, to, to enter and they, they want to turn back so they spend 40 years in the desert until everyone dies uh, except for Joshua and Caleb who remain faithful. Yeah, Aaron's enter into it, the other people will enter into it. Because when they get there and they're told that now it's yours for the taking, like, uh, no way. This is impossible. So yeah. <laughs> so yes, you, you are completely right. It, it, and again, it's not, it's, not, it's not God doing that, it's us doing that. God led them there and said, now it's yours. And they went, it's too much, too scary. The people are, are too, too fierce. We can't do this. Time to leave. And God goes, okay. That's the way you want it. He still feeds them. He still takes care of them. He still watches over them. He brought them there so they could beat other people up and take the land. And they didn't want to do that, I guess. So well, they left. They didn't trust God and would be with them. Oh, they says the people here are too fierce, they're too tall, they're, they're, they're too mighty. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And this goes back to our discussion of, you know, why would God destroy certain people? So the anger of God and what that, and what that means. Um, where, yeah. But yes, no, they're there. <laughs> If we had followed God's plan, this whole extra story would be a lot shorter. <laughs> God is very patient with us. Our, our poor Lord. <laughs> Good. Any other questions? Let's close the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you sent your Son to be a new Moses, lead us to the true promised land of eternal life. Feed us now with your own life and guide us as we try to remove from ourselves from the flesh pots of Egypt and all our doubts and fears. Help us to trust you, to be fed by you alone, and to walk with you always. May all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.